through Romans chapter 2. This is lesson number 12 in our study on Calvinism. Uh, we took the week off last week. I was in Seattle, by the way. I want to say hello to the folks in Seattle. We had a wonderful time, great meetings, and uh, it was really good seeing the saints and, and meeting some new folks as well. So I do want to thank uh, Kyle for teaching last Sunday morning. We're going to pick up this morning and now look at the fifth and final point of Calvinism, the uh, infamous tulip. We're going to look at what is termed the perseverance of the saints, okay? So <clears throat> we'll begin by looking here at Romans chapter 2. And I was talking to Greg here real briefly. Um, the doctrine of perseverance is not the same as the doctrine of assurance. In fact, uh, we'll give you the uh, Reformed definition of perseverance of the saints. Think about the word persevere. Just What does it mean to persevere? And they base the idea of eternal security on this word perseverance. And right away, we, we can already, I think, uh, deduce that there is a real problem. But let's look here at Romans chapter 2 and uh, beginning at verse 6. Who will render to every man according to his deeds to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life. Perseverance of the saints. Again, that's the fifth and final point of the five-point system of high Calvinism or classical Calvinism. Perseverance is defined by the reformers, by the way. Uh, all who are chosen by God, redeemed by Christ, and given faith by the Spirit are eternally saved. Now, at the outset, you think, well, eternal security is a good thing, right? Does it seem a little loud in here? does seem a little warm. Do you want... Uh, it's a little warm as well. Do you know how to just uh, kick it down a little bit? I'll tell you what. Give me one second here. It is a little bit warm here. Oh. They say never walk off the screen. Now watch. In three minutes, we're going to have people complaining that it's too cold in here, right? So, all righty. All right. I hope it'll hopefully feel a little more comfortable. Test, test. All right. I think we got the sound level real well. All right, uh, so let, let's start over again, all right? Uh, the perseverance of the saints as defined by Reformed theology. All who are chosen by God, redeemed by Christ, and given faith by the Spirit are eternally saved. Now, at the outset, eternal security is a good thing. It sounds good, correct? But we got to keep reading. The definition continues. They are kept in faith by the power of Almighty God, and thus persevere to the end. Now, that's a strange concept regarding eternal security. Again, that's not the same thing as eternal assurance, and we'll kind of clarify that in just a second. Just look at this term, perseverance. By definition, it means to continue on. It means to persist in pursuit of something. The idea is you hold on, you hang on, you, you, uh, you, you hold to something, you keep on keeping on. Now, wait a minute. If we understand the Bible definition of eternal security or the Bible concept of eternal security, is there any exhortation to keep on keeping on? The Bible understanding or the Bible teaching of eternal security is intended to provide rest. Eternal security, as defined by the Bible, means that we no longer persist in something, but rather we now rest in something. So I want you to clearly understand when the term perseverance of the saints is used to try and define eternal security, it really isn't eternal security as the Bible would teach it. It's a type of eternal security that this theological system is going to teach. Again, the, at the outset, why do you have to, quote, persevere? Already, the presumption is that, quote, eternal security is dependent upon the believer's capacity to persevere 
in the faith. Why does the why does the the doctrine of perseverance of the saint? Why is this an important point? And I want, if anything, to demonstrate that is not eternal security. Uh, there are some who call themselves one point Calvinists. What they mean is they reject the first four points, but they adhere to the fifth point because they believe in eternal security. But the Calvinistic teaching of eternal security is quite different than the way the Bible teaches eternal security. So to persevere, to continue on, to persistently pursue. The concept, for example, is found, Romans chapter 2, notice once again verse 7, to them who by patient, what? Continuance in well-doing. Now, what the covenant theologian ultimately teaches is, the Holy Spirit is going to guarantee that the elect are going to continue in well-doing. Reformed theology will teach that the Holy Spirit will guarantee that the elect will never depart from the faith, that the elect will never fall away from the faith. So when you really begin to boil it down... The Calvinist believes in unconditional election, but they truly believe in conditional justification. Do you see the difference? The Calvinist will argue that God uh, has already by eternal decree determined who the elect are. A group are in and a group are lost. And so what God did do by eternal decree is he, by sovereign grace, determined who the elect are. You're the elect and you're saved and you're going to heaven regardless of any act of faith on your part. Okay, so uh, when you again begin to boil it down, you're elect unconditionally, but the reform understanding of justification is conditional. They demand that the elect persist and continue in the faith, continue in a life of godly behavior, continue in the faith, which prevents them from falling away or falling victim to apostasy, or else you're really not saved. So salvation is dependent upon good works. The Calvinist will explain, but the Holy Spirit is going to guarantee and ensure that the elect will meet the conditions of justification. Now that's how the system works. The doctrine of the perseverance of the saints, the Holy Spirit is going to ensure that the elect will always meet the demands of conditional justification. Well, what are the conditions of justification? You can't fall away from the faith. You must live a godly life. And let me add this. We'll talk about this a little bit later on. There is no real assurance in this system. My son, when he was in high school, had a Bible teacher in his class who told the class, I wish I was there, I would like to have heard it right out of his lips. This teacher said, he does not know if he's going to heaven. Now, he's been teaching the Bible for decades. He's teaching teenagers the Bible for decades. And he tells the class, I do not know if I'm going to heaven. Why? Because I do not know if I am the elect. The high Calvinist, the, the garden variety Calvinism the classical Calvinist, has no assurance. Why? Because the elect will be persistent in godly living. Now, they're honest enough to conclude, I'm not always godly. And we're going to look at some of the verses that strike terror to the hearts of Calvinists. They don't have assurance, folks. They be this is so sad. They believe in eternal security, but they have no assurance that they have it. R.C. Sproul, he actually said, a person may believe in Jesus Christ, a person may believe in the gospel, 
A person may believe they're saved. A person may believe they're on their way to heaven. But if they're not elect, they're going to hell for all of eternity. So here you have a case in point. A teacher who's been teaching the Bible who doesn't know if he's the elect. Gosh, can you imagine you teach the Bible for 40, 50, 60 years and you're in the lake of fire? What was the whole point? I I don't quite. So be careful. Do not assume that perseverance of the saints is a good thing that guarantees eternal security. Stop. The word perseverance is only used, remember, we've been demonstrating the five points of Calvinism, language that isn't even scriptural. I, I, you know, granted, you might find the principles or the concepts. The word perseverance is only used one time when Paul exhorts the believers to pray for all the saints in prayer and supplication, right? And he, and he says, uh, in perseverance, okay? We're supposed to toil and continually pursue praying for one another. That's the only time the word persevere is used. But again, the concept is found. Verse 7, once again, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing. Guess what Reformed theology says? Well, the Holy Spirit is going to ensure that the elect will continue in what? Well-doing. The Holy Spirit's going to make sure that your life is nothing but an unbroken, continual effort of doing well. Okay? Go over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Reject the perseverance of the saints. Don't even call yourself a one-point Calvinist. Believe in eternal security as the Bible teaches it, but don't confuse it with the perseverance of the saints. Quite frankly, you don't have to persevere in anything to be eternally secure. And, And we'll demonstrate that in the Word of God, okay? 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, we're going to look at these proof texts a little bit later, but 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. So guess what the Calvinist does? Oh, no. You have to continue. Keep reading the verse. For in doing this, thou shalt both, what? Save thyself and them that hear thee. A couple of problems, by the way. If this doctrine of perseverance is is true and you conclude the elect are eternally secure, why in the world does the Apostle Paul provide all of these exhortations to continue on? Think about it. Perseverance of the saints. The Holy Spirit's going to guarantee that you're going to continue on. Then why does Paul have to bother writing, you better keep continuing on? It doesn't make sense. Why doesn't he say, hey, don't worry about it. You're going to continue on because you're the elect. So so we got a real problem with that, don't we? Now, the verse does say, verse 16, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continue, that's the word perseverance. For in doing this, thou shalt both save. You see, if you want to be saved, if you want to meet the qualifications of eternal life, salvation unto eternal life, You have to continue on. So thank God in sovereign grace, He gives the elect the Holy Spirit to guarantee that you do it. That's not eternal security. One one other passage in this regard. Go to chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Chapter 6, verse 12. 1 Timothy 6, verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold. You see that word? Lay hold on eternal life. You understand what it means to lay hold. Now, we're going to clearly define that. The Calvinist interprets that as, you better cling to this because you might let go. But wait a minute. By the sovereign grace of God, the Holy Spirit's going to ensure that I don't let go. Then why why is Paul even telling us to do that? I hope we, we get a clearer picture. So the idea of laying hold you got to cling to eternal life because it might just slip out of your hands. You see, their premise of justification is completely wrong. Go to verse 19. 
laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold. You better hold on, grab on, cling to it. Lay hold on eternal life because it might just slip out of your hands. But according to Calvinism, don't worry. The Holy Spirit's going to guarantee that you meet the qualifications to hold on. They believe that salvation unto eternal life is dependent upon one's performance. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit to intervene. Because you and I in the flesh can never persistently hold on and produce the works of godliness. Their answer is the Holy Spirit will lead you to do that. But that's not the Bible answer to this dilemma. I want to quote from some of these Calvinist theologians. These are literal report. The elect are saved by enduring faith. Think about that. The elect are saved by enduring faith. Another quote. The Holy Spirit continues to give the elect faith to keep from falling away. So do you understand their premise is you could lose it. But the Holy Spirit will give you the faith so that you don't fall away. Another quote, the elect will not fall away. The elect will persevere in faith and holiness to the end. Because that's required to be justified. Their whole premise is wrong. You know what the Bible teaches? We are saved because of a one-time act of faith in an enduring Lord. Calvinism says, don't worry, the Holy Spirit will give you enduring faith to the end. The Bible is pretty clear. No, we're saved by a one-time act of faith in a moment of time in a Savior who is enduring that's the difference the perseverance of the faith a saints should be called perseverance in faith because the the teaching is you have to endure in faith when the bible says wait by faith we rest in an enduring lord and savior he's the one who endures okay so we want to be extremely careful all right don't conclude that the perseverance of the saints is a good thing. It is not. It's not even a Bible doctrine. Okay? And we're going to find out they use proof texts that, that uh, are, have, have nothing to do with justification on eternal life. Okay? John Piper, go to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Um, John Piper, he's one of the more well-known leaders of this new Calvinism, this new Reformed theology. Now, of course, you have R.C. Sproul and you have John MacArthur and others, you know. But John Piper, he's got that church out there in Minnesota. He is quite a leader. Uh, He is a diehard five-point Calvinist, okay? And uh, this is what John Piper says in regards to this fifth point, okay? He says, I quote, We must own up to the fact that our final salvation. Do you have a problem with that? Do you see the premise is all wrong? The premise is that justification is conditioned upon one's work, upon one's ability to endure in the faith. Listen, our final salvation. You know, you know, Paul, if we have time, you know how many times Paul says, we which are saved, past tense. What is this, our final salvation? John Piper said, we are saved. I'm I'm sorry. Um, He says, we must own up to the fact that our final salvation is made contingent upon the subsequent obedience, which comes from faith. See, that's a condition, law-based system of justification. 
It hinges upon your ability to obey. But don't worry, the Holy Spirit's going to make sure you obey. What happens when you don't obey? You know why there's no assurance? Because a teacher out there who is honest enough to say, the only way you can know if you're the elect is if you're consistently godly and obedient. Guess what? He's honest enough to, to admit, I'm not. So now they live in terror. Because guess what, folks? They do fail. They do sin. Then they have to wonder, maybe I am not the elect. R.C. Sproul, in an interview, he shared how one night he was, he was in bed and the realization that he might not be the elect. He just, he, 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 he was consumed with overwhelming dread and terror. You know why? Because he's honest enough to admit, I do have evil thoughts. I do have evil behavior. I do have evil attitudes. And according to the doctrine of Calvinism, the elect, they're not supposed to have that. We're going to go to a verse that, that just throws a match. I, I mean, so their idea of justification is conditional to begin with. In 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, this is the verse that John Piper uses to, to support the idea that our final, quote, salvation is contingent upon obedience, which comes from faith. So the Holy Spirit's got to keep making sure you have enduring faith. You see, he's got to keep doing that. He's got to keep doing that, okay? Here's the verse that he used, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. How do you do that? If you're the elect, how do you make it sure? If you're elect, does it matter? The elect are the elect, right? According to the, five, you know, the whole system of Calvinism. Right off the bat, you got to think, well, how does an elect person, can an elect person ever lose their salvation? Can the elect, remember, irresistible grace, right? And, and the issue of sovereign grace, sovereign grace in uh, election, not sovereign grace in justification. So, wait a minute, make your election sure, verse 10, for if ye do these things, ye shall never, what, fall. John Piper goes around and he's telling, hey, listen, the elect, we got to make it sure. And, and, you know, if we make it sure, we're not going to fall. But if you're the elect, do you have a choice? If you're the elect, do you have any say? If you're the elect, you're already guaranteed. But there's, a, there's a, an underlying fear. But what happens if I mess up? Maybe I'm not the elect. And by the way, when Peter talks about making your election sure, in what sense? Make it sure in your thinking. For example, go to chapter 3, verse 17. You know, again, context, context, context. I am just stunned. These guys all have doctorate degrees in theology. They all have PhDs. And by the way, they're intelligent. They're far more intelligent than I am. And I'm stunned because they don't know how to read. They don't know how to let... Can you imagine if they applied their system of interpretation of Scripture in other avenues of life? Imagine if they would read law books or medical books or accounting books the same way they read God's Word. Man, they're in a heap of trouble here. So if Peter says, make your election sure, do you think Peter's going to explain what he means by that? Well, he does. Chapter 3, verse 17. Chapter 3, verse 17. Uh, ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, be, beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your salvation, fall from your elect, but fall from what? Your own what? Steadfastness. You know how they're, the little flock, they're not supposed to hang on because they might lose their eternal life. They're supposed to lay hold upon their election, their understanding of who they are so that they're not led away in their 
steadfastness. Don't be, don't fall victim to to uh, the the policy of evil and the the deceit and the false message regarding the you know the antichrist and so forth. It's not an issue of keeping yourself saved. It's ensuring that you're operating with an understanding and an assurance that you are. For example, go to First John. Go to go to First John chapter three. This idea that, oh, no, you got to make sure you're the elect. And how do you make sure? Well, you got to have a life of continual godly behavior. Well, the Holy Spirit's supposed to guarantee it. Yes, but I'm not. There is no assurance, folks, none whatsoever. By the way, Paul, when he writes to the church, the body of Christ, he talks about how the gospel came on to you with much assurance. The Lord doesn't want us ever living with doubt, fear, wonder, dread. Am I going to heaven? Listen, the Bible teaches a no so salvation. Calvinism rejects that idea. Here's 1 John chapter 3. And notice beginning at uh, verse, uh, well, look at verse 19. 1 John chapter 3 and notice there verse 19. Oh, that's not the verse. Chapter 5. Go to chapter 5. Wrong verse. Uh, chapter 5. Go to chapter 5. Uh, look there at verse 11. Uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 11. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Now look at verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may what know that ye have what now understand there's a context here with the point is this is it possible for a believer to know they have eternal life absolutely and god wants his people to know you have eternal life there is no virtue you are not spiritual having this false a uh, self-righteous belief that to be convinced you're going to heaven is presumption. And you know what? I'm too holy and too humble to believe that I can go to heaven. Listen, you don't qualify for heaven. Nobody qualifies for heaven. And it's not an act of self-righteous uh, uh, piety to say, I know I'm going to heaven. Wait a minute. Because the God of heaven is telling us it's not presumption on your part. It's the assurance that God desires His people to have. He wants us to know we have eternal life. And we walk with a confidence and an assurance that causes us to be steadfast. It causes the believer to be stable in life and not to be battered and tossed around by every deceitful wind of doctrine that would try to, deny, to, to, try to convince us that you're not the child of God. So, so uh, go to, um, well, I'll tell you what. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, let me just say this. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, Piper, by the way, and, and, and others, you know, they go on. And, and here's another guy. He says, a believer's salvation is not merely manifested by perseverance, but rather is saved by perseverance. You see that? You're saved by perseverance. And that's what the Holy Spirit's going to seek to do. The believer must practice godly behavior to be saved. Don't call yourself a one-point Calvinist. When you dig into the weeds... And you discover what they mean by perseverance. You're going right to hell, folks. You're going to hell. Because there's no one that continue, that can continue in well-doing. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See that? Ah, oh, but don't worry. In God's eternal decree, He's going to make sure you do well-doing. But see, they know, I don't. The moment you lust, you failed. That's sin. 
maybe, here's one that'll scare the britches off you. Go to 1 John again. Go to 1 John. And go to 1 John chapter 3. And, 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 you know, these guys, they read a passage like this, and they're terrified. 1 John chapter 3. Notice 1 John chapter 3. Look at verse 8. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. He that committeth sin is of the what? Oh, boy. Anybody here commit sin? Even after you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you're, you're honest. That's good. <laughs> there, are some, there are some that... There are some that are, they'll argue that, no, I do not sin anymore. Yeah, wow. If a man wants to be ignorant, let him remain ignorant. Uh, verse 8, he that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. You see why the Calvinists, they live in absolute, ho- I mean, terror. They don't believe that you can have that assurance. Listen, you commit sin, according to verse 9, you're not born of God. Keep reading. For this seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Verse 9 is what keeps R.C. Sproul up at night. Verse 9 is what keeps guys like Piper and others up at night. Because 9 is, verse, is very clear. Whosoever is born of God doth not what? And they know they commit it. Then maybe I'm not the elect. You see what happens in their thinking? This stuff is so dangerous. The doctrine of perseverance is not the same as the doctrine of assurance. Don't get the clue. And, and this has nothing to do with what the Bible teaches regarding justification. Oh, and by the, before we leave, well, what is verse 9 talking about? Uh, I ought to just leave you hanging. Uh, context, context. You think maybe John's talking about a particular sin? Ah, I'll give you a little clue. Go to chapter 5, just so that you don't have to freak out Wait a minute, if you're born of God, you're not supposed to commit sin. And we're not talking about whether, of course, nationally Israel is born of God and so forth. But, but wait a minute, um, what does it mean if you, you can't commit sin? Well, you know, John, in, in chapter 5, um, he says some things in verse um, 16. Look at verse 16. If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not on... Wait a minute, I thought if you're born of God... You don't commit sin. But here you have a brother who's committing a sin. Now, the ver- notice John doesn't say, oh, then he's really not a brother. He's really the tear. He's really the devil. No. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, that has to do with the law program in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. Now it's getting confusing. If you're born of God, you cannot sin. But then now John's saying, well, wait a minute. There's a sin on the death, and then there's a sin that's not on the death. Oh, John's talking about something real specific here. Verse 17, all unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not on the death. So there is sin. One will kill you or will lead on to death, but then there's there's sinning that doesn't result in death. Number one, who is John writing to? He's not writing to you and me. So, number one, don't get too panicky right now because he's not writing to the church of the body of Christ. Verse 18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Wait, he's talking about a sin not unto death and a sin unto death. Whosoever is born of God is not going to commit the sin unto death. But is it possible for one who is born of God to commit a sin not unto death? You're real confused, right? Well, that's what John's talking about at the end of verse 18. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one touches him what? 
you got to understand something about the satanic policy of evil during the time of Jacob's trouble. During the tribulational period, there is an intense campaign of deceit and there is an, an economic system, there's a political system, there's a religious system in which the little flock finds themselves under. And you got to understand something about the wicked one. you got to understand something about, for example, the mark of the beast. you got to understand some things about how the... John isn't just saying in general... Oh, you'll never sin. He, he's talking about a specific sin in the context of the tribulational period under the authority of this man of sin whom we call the Antichrist. Okay? By the way, is there a sin during the seventh week of Daniel that is under the sentence of death? What happens if you were to take the mark of the beast? See, that's a sin unto death, okay? Now, go back to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, so by, by reading some of those passages in John, 1 John, for example, you understand why Calvinists have no sh- assurance at all? The only way to know if you're elect, how do you know, by the way, how do you know you're elect? You know, Paul writes to the Thessalonians. Uh, go to 1 Thessalonians. <laughs> Let's go to 1 Thessalonians. The Calvinist says, but I don't know if I'm elect. And if I don't know I'm elect and I commit sin, I might not be the elect. And now I wake up in a cold sweat every night thinking I might end up in the lake of fire even if I've dedicated my whole life teaching supposedly God's word, teaching Jesus, teaching the gospel, teaching the cross, teaching the word of God. But because I'm not elect, I go to hell. I go to lake of fire. Man. I'd wake up with a cold sweat every night as well. Absolute terror. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Notice how Paul, he says verse 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 4. Knowing, brethren beloved, your what? The Calvinist says, I don't know if I'm elect. You know what Paul says to the body of Christ? Knowing your what? Election of God. Is it possible to know whether you're elect? Yes. Because God tells the believing sinner, you're in my son Jesus Christ. Guess what? You're in the elected one. Remember, we're not going to review any of this. Election has to do with a person. There is a person in the word of God who is called mine elect. And if you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are now placed in living, loving, eternal union with Jesus Christ. Guess what? You are now in God's eternal elective purpose. That's why Paul says, knowing it. How can a Calvinist say, I don't know? Well, boy, Paul sure had the assurance. Verse 4 again. Knowing, brethren beloved, you're what? I hope if you know, when you know Pauline doctrine, you study God's word rightly divided, you recognize that God has a specific, unique dispensational program and purpose today called the dispensation of the grace of God. When you understand what God is doing today, we have absolute, utmost confidence and assurance. I know my election because I'm in the elected one. And I know what God's telling me about being in the elected one. God has a glorious, eternal purpose that he's elected to accomplish. And if you're in Jesus Christ, you're elect. Okay? Let's read verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in assurance. Yeah. Don't take away God's word. Don't add or subtract. Paul didn't say... And in assurance. How much assurance? Much, much assurance. As ye know what manner of men. Uh, so, so when it comes to knowing, there is a no-so election and there is a no-so salvation unto eternal life. And it comes with much assurance. Not a little bit of assurance. Much assurance, Okay. All right, now go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. I've asked you to go there three times already, so no promises that we'll end up there. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Here, notice some of the verses that are misused to try to, to promote uh, some of these things. 
this is so bizarre. They actually use this verse, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved. Well, of course. It's a reference to what? Soul salvation unto eternal life, right? See how a Calvinist is going to take that verse? Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they, here we continue in faith and charity and holiness and sobriety. So here we go. The condition for salvation is to continue in the faith. The perseverance of the saints basically says God's going to make sure you have the enduring faith that results in salvation. You know what Paul says? You're already saved in Jesus Christ. And it's not an issue of an enduring faith. It's an issue of your one-time act of faith in a specific moment of time when you decided to believe the enduring Savior. That's what the Bible teaches, okay? So we, we want, but now, look at verse 15. Is Paul talking about soul salvation? Of course not. How do we know? Look at verse 15. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in what? It doesn't, how does anybody interpret childbearing as saved unto eternal life? If this were true, every woman should have a baby, and then you're going to heaven. You know? I mean, if that's your, you know, that's, if that's your system of exegesis, then I encourage every woman to get pregnant. Because if you bear a child, guess what? You're going to go to heaven. By the way, you know what Calvinism teaches about infant? Do you, this is what's, again, it's such a convoluted system. You have a guy like R.C. Sproul who says, I do not know if I'm elect. But R.C. Sproul will tell you that if a baby is water baptized, by two believing parents, they have automatic heaven. They're they're automatically saved. It is so absolutely convoluted, right? Show me one verse in the Bible that talks about baby baptism, infant baptism. Show me one verse in the Bible that says water baptism will give you soul salvation unto eternal life. And what verse ever says that, that, uh, you know what verse they use. They use the verse in 1 Corinthians, okay? I, I, I don't want to di- digress right now. So uh, I know that baby is elect going to heaven because that little baby was water baptized by two believing parents. But I, who have taught the Bible of all my life, I don't know if I'm the elect. Man, it, it, it's just, a, uh, it, it, it's heart-wrenching. First Timothy chapter 4, First Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Here's another verse that they'll, they'll try to use. First uh, Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue. There's that idea of perseverance. Continue in them. But the Holy Spirit's going to go ahead and make sure you do that. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Can I just reiterate? If the fifth point ensures that the Holy Spirit guarantees you're going to persevere, What is the point of writing this exhortation down? Why the exhortation to persevere if according to your fifth point, the elect will persevere? It it just does not make any sense. Just so that we're all real clear about what the Bible teaches regarding eternal security, go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Let's let Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, who was selected by the Lord Jesus Christ personally, tell us some things about the unconditional nature of justification. Romans chapter 3, and notice verse 24, Romans 3 verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We said it a minute, in Christ In Christ, in Christ. Justification is free by grace. Verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Justification is a one-act, one-time phenomenon. 
you believe in Jesus, you're justified. Spill down to chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward, not reckon of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Listen, this isn't an ongoing process. This justification has nothing to do with your ability or inability to endure in the faith. It has nothing to do with your capacity to hold on and not fall victim to apostasy because, quite frankly, Paul's going to describe men who are in the faith who then choose to depart from it. And Paul never, ever says they've been de-justified. Never. Go to chapter 5. Look at uh, chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being just... Being... That, that's a present state reality. Therefore, being, we're not waiting for some final salvation, dependent upon our ability to endure. Some final salvation contingent upon obedience in faith. According to that verse, we already have it. In, if you believe in Jesus, as chapter 3 says, Verse 1, therefore, being justified by faith, we have what? Peace with God. A couple more, we'll go to Ephesians chapter 1. And once you are justified, once God has imputed righteousness by grace, apart from any work of any kind at any time, you know what God the Holy Spirit does? He doesn't give you a capacity to persevere. He doesn't give you some supernatural uh, capacity to persevere in the faith so that you endure unto the end. And we're going to go to that verse. Guess what verse is one of their favorite ones? He that endures unto the end. You notice they have Bible verses to justify their doctrinal system. You see why? It is critically important to rightly divide the word of truth because if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, you will end up in hell believing all the verses you want to believe. You can believe that verse, endure on to the end, and you're going to go to heaven, but it doesn't say that. So we got to understand why some of those, that's why they're all screwed up. They're picking and choosing all sorts of, there's just this smorgasbord of, of doctrine and, and now there's just absolute confusion. And like Peter says, twisting the scriptures onto their own what? Destruction. Um, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth the gospel, the good news of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were what? Sealed with that Holy Spirit. Thank God Paul never ever says that after you believe, we're given the Holy Spirit to ensure that we persevere until our final salvation. You know what Paul says about the Holy Spirit? He doesn't get us to... He becomes a what? A seal. That's eternal security, folks. Paul says, in whom after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Chapter 4, verse 30. Chapter 4, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are what? Sealed. I don't want the Holy Spirit making me persevere in faith. I want Him to be the seal that gives to me a no-so justification. I know my election and I live with a sense of much assurance. That's what the Apostle Paul certainly writes. First, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, 2 Timothy 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is where? In Christ Jesus, not in enduring faith. It's in Christ Jesus, not in your enduring faith. One more, go to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, verse 4. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared 
not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being, there's that word, being, it's a present reality, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That's, that's eternal security. Don't let that word perseverance completely destroy the underpinnings of Bible security. Security has nothing to do with your ability. It has to do with the goodness and grace of God. Okay, real quick, Matthew chapter 24. All right, so here are their, quote, proof text, all right? Here are some verses that high Calvinists will use to try to prove that, oh, no, justification, ultimate salvation, hinges upon one's consistent life of obedience. But, hey, relax, the Holy Spirit's going to make sure you do it. But I don't know if he's doing it, but, but see, but, but I don't really know if I'm elect, you know. Convoluted. Here's the verse that is used quite frequently. Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be what? See? Again, you can, you can have all the doctor degrees you ever want. Who has the right to define what salvation, verse 13, is talking about? First of all, verse 13, but he that shall endure unto the what? Well, unto the end of life, of course. No. Go to verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of life? The end of what? The world. So we have a, a context. The question is, how do we know this is the end of the world? So the Lord Jesus, he's going to begin to supply an answer. And he begins to describe some events, the day, you know, the, the, the sorrows. Uh, um, he, he talks about uh, troublous times and, and uh, so on and so forth. And then he does say in verse 13, but he that shall endure unto the what? And that is, un during this period of troublous times, he that endures it to the end, that is the troublous times. In fact, if you drop down to verse 21, drop down to verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor, no, nor ever shall be. One minute. He's talking about the, this, this tribulational period. Verse 29 Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of, of heavens shall be shaken. Jesus is equipping his little flock for this end time period and there are specific signs and you got the beginning of sorrows and you got this, this troublous period of time and the Lord supplies actually a very descript, detailed, precise picture of all of this. He is not saying if you endure to the end of your life. He's talking about those who find themselves in this troublous time. If you endure unto the end, you're going to be saved. So number one, what end is the Lord Jesus talking about? And number two, what kind of salvation is the Lord talking about? He provides a very, I mean, you've got these details of all of this trouble. Uh, go back, look there at verse 22. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be what? Saved. Saved in what sense? Is he talking about salvation unto eternal life? Or saved from the calamities and the horrors and the events of the troublous times? Just because you hear, see the word saved does not mean eternal life. So we got to let the context tell us what kind of salvation is he talking about. Verse 22 again, 
And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall also arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great things and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. The salvation has to do with all of the phenomena that's taking place during the 70th week of Daniel. You have a false message of Antichrist. You have signs. You have miracles. You have deceit. Listen, and there are horrors that are, that are uh, uh, associated with all of this. He that endures to the end of that period of time shall be saved not unto eternal life, but shall be saved from the effects of of this satanic policy of evil. That's what he's talking about, okay? And just read, again, I'm going to say it again, read the context. I don't understand why. Here's another one, Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Here's another quote-proof text that is used to justify the idea of the Holy Spirit that now ensures that the saints, or the elect rather, will persevere. Luke chapter 22. Luke 22, verse 31. Luke 22, verse 31. And uh, here we read, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Look at verse 32. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith, what? Fail not. Ah, you see? Peter needed divine intervention. You see, uh, that your faith fell not. Again, that's why it's probably more accurate to say perseverance in faith than the perseverance of the saints because it has everything to do with enduring faith to the very end, okay? So the high Calvinist takes verse 32 and they say, oh, it's a reference to enduring faith so that Peter now doesn't get, I guess, de-justified that he truly is the elect, or I guess. I, I don't understand how they, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith faileth not. But keep reading. And when thou art converted, wait a minute. That means Peter's faith did fail. In what sense? Why would Jesus say, I'm praying for you that you fail not? In the context, guess what he does? Keep reading. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both unto prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that. Thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. We won't go there. In Matthew chapter 26, you know what Jesus said? All of you guys are going to be offended. All of you guys are going to deny me. Remember what Jesus said? You deny me before men. I'm going to deny you before who? Jesus says, Peter, you're going to deny me. So if Jesus says, I prayed for you, Peter, that your faith fail not, if that's a reference to perseverance, guess what happened to Peter and the other 11 guys? You know what happened to them? They failed miserably. They denied, Peter denied the Lord Jesus. All the other guys, they were offended. They fled. They scattered. So the faith that the Lord's talking about isn't, the Calvinist understanding of faith, because Peter did fail. Jesus is not praying that, Peter, you're immune from failure, that you're immune from sin, because Peter did fail. You just keep reading. So then, wait a minute, that his faith fail not, go back there to uh, verse uh, 32 again. Look at verse 32 again. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not and when thou art converted now what does it mean to be converted that means hey when, when you have this about faith to convert means to turn around in other words peter you're going to fail me you're going to deny me but you're going to be what you're going to be converted and when you're converted strengthen thy brethren listen the faith that Jesus Christ is talking about is not enduring faith on the salvation. It's having the faith which enables him to stand strong. Hence, when you're converted, Peter, 
I want you to strengthen your brethren. That faith is what's going to work in Peter. It has nothing to do with enduring faith onto eternal life. That is not what... And, and you know what? We're, we're going to stop. The Lord Jesus already breathed into them the Holy Spirit. Are you saying that Peter may not have been the elect unless Jesus Christ prayed that your faith fail not? Wow. Then, how about every other elect person? Is Jesus praying for every, every other elect person that they fail not, that their faith fail not? See, you start running into, you, you talk about a quagmire. You start, you start getting caught in, in the weeds, and, and, and things just, just get absolutely confusing. All right, so uh, no, we're going to stop. We've got to stop. There, there's probably another half dozen verses that are used to proof text this fifth point, and uh, it doesn't deal with eternal life. That's the fundamental problem. Don't read verses and automatically assume it's talking about eternal life. Look at the immediate context, the surrounding context, and you find out that that 99% of the time it's talking about something completely different. Okay, Father, we do thank you for your grace and for your love. We thank you, Father, for the eternal security that you do provide through your word, a security that's based upon the faithfulness of our Savior, not a security that's dependent upon our faithfulness, uh, uh, a security that's dependent upon the endurance of your mercy and grace forevermore. Uh, not dependent upon our endurance in the faith. We thank you, Lord, that we can have rest and, and we can have confidence and uh, we can be strengthened and, and be steadfast uh, because of the promise that you make unto us that we are justified, that we are declared righteous, and that we now possess eternal life as a, as a gift and never to be taken away. We thank you for that assurance in Christ's name. Amen.